Um, thanks for having me. Um, I, um, I've got a, a quick presentation, really, which is uh, some background to get us into the cupping, um, which I think is really going to be uh, the most kind of telling part of the presentation. Um, but if, uh, if you're, any of you are like me, um, when I started with the coffee, I needed a way to track what was going on. So, you know, for me, that became the process, my first steps in profiling, which was um, recording time and temperature and what was going on in the roast on a piece of paper, um, every roast, you know, hundreds and hundreds of roasts. And, and, and you know, that for me was the foundation in, in profiling. And, you know, recently I, I you know, come to the realization that well, there's a better way. There's, there's a couple of, couple of real positive things to the manual method of roast profiling, um, but uh, the newer um, software applications that are available uh, give us an opportunity to put our mind into what's going on in the roast and concentrate less on recording the data. But I think that that was really a great way to start. Um, it, uh, it gave me a kind of a fundamental understanding of what, what our purpose is. So in any case, um, here, what I want to talk about is what's the purpose of profiling? And, and what's the purpose of this discussion? And, and it's uh, really to develop a greater understanding of the relationship of our roasting systems our coffees and what's going on during that process. Um, I think oftentimes profiling becomes a way for people to simply record and repeat what they've done and less a tool to understand how to make some positive changes uh, in, in the coffees that they're roasting. Um, so, so we're gonna talk about some of some basic stuff which I, I think most of you obviously will, will already uh, be familiar with, but it's foundation for us to just uh, to start thinking about the process and to start thinking differently. So um, what do we mean by profiling? Uh, profiling is, you know, it can mean a lot of different things. It can be describing anything, an object, a person. Um, uh, for us, with respect to our roasts, it's a, it's a description of the inputs and the controls that we're imposing on, on the roasting system while we're roasting coffee. Um, but it can also, you know, rather than be a, uh, like an after the fact sort of recording, it can be a, um, an intentional um, uh, setup. It can be a decision, a conscious decision to, to affect a certain result in the coffee that we're, um, that we're working with. Um, so, so it essentially can become a plan for controlling that development path of our coffee. Um, also, um, you know, a, measure, a method for ensuring consistency. Uh, when we do eventually lock into a profile that we prefer for a certain coffee, that can be our reference point. That can be something that can help us with our, our repeatability. So, a couple of things here. Um, just th these are my observations from, from my perspective as a roaster. What, what, what's our role and what are the important things? Like first and foremost, um, breaking out of our uh, preconceptions of what a coffee should be is an important thing. So understanding our customers, um, understanding what their needs are and trying to develop uh, products that meet their expectations and needs. Um, understanding our coffees. You know, what is it that we want to be, what, what do we want to be doing for ourselves as well? And that goes to our stylistic approach. Um, subsequently, you know, then what are our objectives? Are we you know, trying to make filter coffee? Are we trying to make espresso coffee? And how do the, the influences that we have on the roast affect those specific types of, of uh, uh, coffee preparations? Um, ultimately, you know, roasting a delicious coffee. And then, and then another thing I want to um, emphasize here is I'm not, I'm not going to, tell you guys how to roast or, or even suggest how I like to roast coffee. Um, it's not about there being a right or a wrong way. And, and, and I think it's really important to realize that there isn't a perfect roast. There isn't, you know, for any given coffee, there is no, no one perfect roast that's gonna be like, this is it. Um, what we wanna do as individuals, what our customers are expecting, um, those, are, those are all things that go into it, and that's where it's really important to understand how we can craft those roasts with, with putting together a purpose, purposeful profile. And, and again, I think as soon as we lock into it and we decide we've got that figured out, we're, we're gonna stop learning about coffee. So I like to, I really like to try to break outside the box and go to some extremes with, with how I approach the coffee and, and find a, a space in the middle that actually works. So, some basic terminology, this is all the basic stuff. You know, Trisha has, has gone over all of this in her, um, her you know, prior cupping discussion, so I'm not gonna get into the technical cupping, but these are just terms that relate to, to what we're trying to, to um, 
uh, either showcase or diminish in a roast. Um, uh, these are things that we have an effect on in, in our roasting process. So acidity, of course, you know, it's the, that essential uh, quality. It can be uh, overwhelming or underwhelming. We want to try to find balance with that. Um, it can be used to describe that flavor descriptor. It can also be used to describe the, the specific components that we can quantify in the coffee. Um, so, you know, it, it has kind of a dual meaning there, but with relationship to this discussion, it's going to be primarily um, to the, the quantifiable acids. Aromas, obviously, you know, the sensations, um, those, are, those are created primarily during the uh, specific parts of the roasting process that most of you will be aware of. Um, body, mouthfeel, um, inherent qualities of coffee and also roast induced qualities um, and something that we can control with, with the right proper application of heat at certain times in the roasting process. And then ultimately the balance um, where we're just putting it all together and that's what we're trying to find. And, and that balance point um, uh, for, for us trying to define a customer's needs and what our specific objectives are may be very different than what we're trying to do on you know, a few graders uh, sheet. So this isn't about scoring coffee, this is about trying to, to find a pathway to create a coffee that you want to be selling to your customers. Um, so in, in roasting, um, you know, I've worked on a number of different types of roasting systems and so I'm gonna talk about some of the, the variables that you know, some of us have control over, some of us don't have control over, but from system to system, they do vary. Um, the airflow rate, that you know, people talk about airflow, people talk about constant airflow or, or you know, variable air volume, that sort of stuff. Airflow is, is a really important part of the roasting process because um, the, the airflow is what determines the amount of heat specifically that's applied to your batch of coffee. So, I mean, I, I hear people talk about variable systems um, I, I prefer on certain types of roasting machines to have fixed volumes because we begin to get into circumstances where our control points um, can, can really uh, get out of control for us. So um, uh, airflow, uh, changes in airflow are directly proportional to the amount of heat that's delivered to the coffee. So, so if you're increasing your airflow, if you want to maintain the same uh, environment temperature, you have to proportionally increase your gas flow. So it's one of those things that I think is really tricky. Um, most of the probats that I um, have worked on, um, we use uh, fixed airflow. Um, Loring roasters, for example, newer roasters, those use a variable airflow, um, a different, entirely different type of system, which is something, again, to consider when building a roast profile working on a fixed inlet air temperature, they need to adjust the airflow um, with the gas percentage in order to control that specific uh, inlet air temperature. So it's, again, it has an effect on the way the heat is transferred to the coffee and will become a little more relevant uh, a little further into the discussion. So then again, um, for, for uh, our bean temperature, um, that is something that in my experience has been um, all across the map. You know, we all, we all record our, um, our data for our bean temperature. Some of us record environment temperature as well. Um, but placement of your bean probe in your coffee roaster can have a significant impact on the, the way that that <coughs> measures that uh, uh, temperature. Um, so going from, from one probe at to another probe at, you might see variation of 30 degrees Fahrenheit or, or 10, 15 degrees Celsius just based on the placement of the, the thermocouple. So it's important to, to remember that, like when we're talking about this terminology here, profiles need to be specific to a specific roaster, to a specific roasting machine. They don't translate directly, and you need to make some compensations in, in how you approach your uh, uh, setting up your roast profiles um, when you're going to new machinery. Um, so the charge temperature, um, the charge temperature, obviously that's where the, the idle temperature of the roasting chamber and, and um, typically when the coffee roaster's been idling, you're gonna have um, a, a fairly close uh, uh, and similar bean temperature reading and environment temperature reading. It has a big effect on the profile as well. Also, where you are, are you at the beginning of the day, are you in the middle of your, your roasting um, session um, your charge temperature is going to have an impact on where your, your roast bottoms out and your charge, uh, when you charge the 
roasting time with your coffee, where does that bottom temperature go to and where does your roast timing actually begin? So it's, it's really important to note that as well. And again, varies considerably from roaster to roaster um, uh, with regards to the mass of the roaster and also the airflow is, is another considerable, uh, has another considerable, considerable effect on that. Um, drop temperature is the temperature that we're gonna record when um, uh, we terminate the roast for the final temperature. And then the environment temperature again is, is the return air temperature of the, the um, exhaust leaving the roaster. And that's also an important measure because that can tell you with relationship to the amount of energy you're putting into the system, how much heat's actually going into the coffee. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the relationship of our um, steady state of the, the um, pardon me, I'm just jumping ahead here. Um, the steady state of the environment temperature and then the, the as the uh, uh, bean temperature actually approaches that, um, how the relationship works with the energy into the system. So, jump through this quickly here. Rate of rise, I think, is one of the most important things in developing a profile, um, because that's, you know, it's not something to simply record, it's something to use as a, as kind of a target to your, to your or an acceleration uh, measure to your uh, target point. So as you set up your profile, you, you may determine you want to work to a certain endpoint, you may want to work to a certain um, uh, time and temperature for your first crack, um, and all of these things are really important to the rate of rise because going from your immediate location in time to that point um, is, is really helpful to calculate what your preferred rate of rise is as you're going through that, setting up that roast profile, and you can hit those targets pretty accurately when you do so. And then the last uh, bit on the roast uh, terminology, if you're not utilizing any of the damper controls on, on the older probats, uh, say, um, and what this also does is it, is it um, presents a higher level of oxygen in the roasting chamber as well. So the potential at darker roasts, which I, I'm not really certain is a, is a major impact here, but there's a higher potential for oxidation of the cellulose material in the coffee. So um, single pass systems definitely favor lighter to, to medium roast um, uh, methodologies if you're really trying to get a nice well-balanced uh, coffee. Um, there was a, and, and there still still are, systems um, uh, that recirculate portions of the air. Um, what the, the benefit of this primarily is for energy savings, and it's very common in larger roasters. Um, one of the other um, beneficial effects of this is in a recirculating system, you have lower oxygen levels in the uh, roasting air, which of course will then reduce the potential for, for oxidation the cellulose material. Uh, additionally, um, there's higher moisture retention in the system, and so the moisture in the system actually conducts heat better to the coffee um, uh, while it's uh, uh, going through the early stages of the roast. So you can get a very even um, roast development with a recirculating type roaster. But the problem with the old probats was that we have um, you know, fairly low temperature air recirculating. So at, at later stages of the roast, you would get a um, noticeable smokiness that's reintroduced back into the roast. So um, uh, that's one of the things that Loring has actually solved with their roaster. And, and so, so me going from Diedrich to Probat to Loring now, I'm beginning to understand the differences in the effect of a closed system with higher moisture content and less oxygen. Um, and the effects of that. But again, these are all things to consider um, when setting up your profile. So, so I'm gonna, um, again, jump really quickly through some of this stuff here. And these are, the, these are kind of the core bits of um, what we actually have control over. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm a coffee roaster and a systems guy who um, wanted to know more about what's going on in the coffee as I roast it, rather than just um, fire up the roaster, drop coffee in, let it rip, and do a couple of things that, that I've heard that people say are good things to do. I wanted to understand a little bit more about what's actually happening during the roast and when it occurs. And so, so there are a few, few little things that we can do um, with this to um, really try to balance out development of uh, body, of, of sweetness, 
perceived sweetness and acidity in the coffees. And so understanding a few of these things here are really helpful for that. So um, carb carbohydrates in coffee, um, they're, they're you know, simple sugars for the most part. Um, that they're necessary, well there's complex sugars and simple sugars, but the simple sugars are necessary for the Maillard reactions to occur. And what happens in, in um, the coffee is we have all of these different things in there. We have water with a lower boiling point to uh, 100 uh, Celsius to uh, 12 Fahrenheit. So the water's gonna boil off. We have sugars in there that will begin to melt, um, you know, 160 to 200 uh, Celsius. So um, all of these things start to, to happen in this dynamic system, and then interactions start to occur at these temperatures. So how we structure our timing to get to these temperatures can have a big impact on what happens in the resulting coffee, how deep we go into the process of, of these changes occurring. Um, this is gonna happen no matter what. This is, I don't, I don't think there's anybody here um, with maybe one or two exceptions of roast to a degree where we're not gonna have completed Maillard reactions. But this is gonna happen in, in just about every coffee. So how quickly we can actually encourage the Maillard reactions to occur can help us affect our endpoint, whether we wanna go with a longer or shorter endpoint. So it's a real important period um, in determining how quickly you wanna ramp up at the start of the roast can have a big impact on the, the final product. Now, proteins, um, proteins account for about 10 to 13% of the dry weight in coffee. Um, it's also the other um, component that's uh, necessary for the Maillard reactions. Uh, they react with those sugars that begin to, to uh, break down at the temperatures I mentioned previously. And um, uh, this is where in the roast, um, just between, um, Fahrenheit, but I don't know my, um, yeah, just, just starting at around um, 160 degrees, um, we're gonna begin to see these reactions um, occur. And this is where your color, your aroma, and your flavor uh, um, start to develop. Um, so, so the sugars begin to melt, they begin to react with the proteins, the Maillard reactions start to occur, and um, <coughs> then we get prepared for the rest of the roast here. So um, the chlorogenic acids, which everybody um, has heard about, um, again, not, not to, to represent myself as a chemist in any way, um, there, are, there are many, many of these acids, um, and I think for us, from a practical perspective as roasters, we don't need to <coughs> understand exactly what each of them are. We don't need to put up uh, you know, uh, molecular models and that sort of stuff, although it's interesting and it might be you know, beneficial for somebody who has a deep interest. For us to understand generally what's happening and when it happens, I think is most relevant to establishing your, your profile. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting aspects of chlorogenic acids is that roughly 50% of the original chlorogenic acids will be gone, will be decomposed at the level of a medium roast. So, and, and this is, this is um, uh, information that's been measured by science uh, professionals, chemists who, who work with coffee, who have, who have actually analyzed and quantified. So this is, um, this is something that we have to know as a roaster that you know, medium roast, um, half of the chlorogenic acids are gone. Um, they um, definitely are gonna continue to degrade um, throughout the roasting process. And as you can see, um, almost half of the chlorogenic acids um, are um, you know, completely diminished at the end of a, a dark roast. So uh, a couple of key acids in there that, that are major contributors to flavor, these are organic acids, um, uh, quinic acid, um, and citric acid, those are a significant portion. Again, the interesting thing is that these are um, acids that are produced within the degradation of the, the chlorogenic acids. So, so during roasting, they actually increase in, in uh, presence and as the level of chlorogenic acids decrease. So this is where the balancing act starts to come into play. Um, you know, retaining acidity in coffee is an important thing, but understanding what type of acidity are we retaining and is it favorable acidity and does it work in balance with our, with our desired results? Um, it's really something to consider um, and an important part of, of understanding profiling. Um, also, same thing with uh, um, uh, citric acid, but this, this does something a little more interesting. Um, it, um, it's going to increase 
um, initially during the rust, and then eventually it will begin to decrease. And so there's there's kind of a balance point, a real specific balance point for um, uh, understanding development of, of the citric components in your coffee. And again, I think a real important um, measure here is that that the boiling point of citric acid is is 307 degrees, and so so it's going to begin to boil out. Once it's developed, it's going to just begin to dissipate along with all the other um, uh, you know, CO2 and water and everything else that's been expelled from the coffee. So, so we, have, we have acids that are increasing in prevalence, we have acids that are increasing in prevalence and decreasing. Um, there are um, uh, some other um, uh, inorganic acids that are thought to have an effect on flavor and perception of acidity that, that aren't uh, transformed during the roast, roasting process, but um, do remain and does, you know, like phosphoric acid, but those have to remain in, in kind of a synchronous balance with the, the organic acids that are being changed throughout the process. So, I mean, of course, the Maillard reaction, again, a, a real, um, again, basic understanding of that is it's that primary browning reaction. Um, it's a chemical reaction between the amino acids and the reducing sugars promoted by heating. So um, virtually no amino acids, you know, 4, 428 or 220, that's pretty deep, and, and again, these, Temperature numbers are um, a, a rough range. They're going to vary from roaster to roaster, but that's a pretty dark roast, um, I think. Um, so, but, but that really means that Maillard reactions are completely done at a certain point, and then you're going to begin to oxidize your cellulose, which is not a good thing. Um, moving on. So, caramelization is, is again another um, thing that I think is oftentimes confused with the um, Maillard reaction. It's an entirely different process. It happens later in the roast. This is a contributor to um, less to aromatics as it is to mouthfeel. Um, and this is uh, uh, something that happens later in the roasting pr uh, process, um, I would say further along into the roast development uh, time period. And that's something where consideration of how long do you take a coffee from the, the point of first crack to finish in your roast development will affect the level of caramelization, which um, another significant um, effect of that is that caramelization is the pyrolysis of the sugars that are remaining in the coffee at that point. And so um, where it might taste pleasant to some people, it's definitely going to affect the, the perceived sweetness and the perceived acidity because of the interactions of the uncaramelized sugars with the, the acids um, have um, a physiological balance that occurs. And, and so when we begin to re remove those sugars entirely through caramelization, we lose that. So, um, but if that's your, your result, if you're looking for, you know, if your, your target audience likes dark roasted coffee, which in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm from, um, with, even with the third wave coffee coming up there, a lot of people still really like this dark roasted coffee. Caramelization is really what they're after in controlling caramelization. But it's not going to work for us if we're looking to showcase great coffee as a filter coffee. So, so what does this all mean? Um, I think, again, really understanding your objectives, um, knowing your green coffee, knowing what you have to start with is significantly important, so sample roasting. Um, the purpose of this is, is not, not to say sample roast and then that's you know, going to decide how you roast your, your coffee. This, the whole purpose of this is to get into production quickly without having to do a lot of trial and error on coffee. So sample roast, understand what you have to start with, um, uh, look for the sweetness, look for the acidity, and then uh, determine how you're gonna craft that out. Um, the, again, uh, I talked about the rate of rise being an important um, aspect of this. Um, in the coffees that we are gonna cup in a little while, what I did was I have two different coffees and I've roasted each of those in four different ways. Um, so this is not going to be a, a, like a qualitative, um, like a highly critical cupping. The, the purpose of this is to look at um, a few different approaches to coffee, um, coffee roasting. One, um, uh, first two roasts are using a short, shorter time frame, uh, one with a rapid uh, front acceleration and a slow controlled roast development time. And then the second is going to be a shorter roast profile with a very consistent rate of rise. So, so um, uh, stretching out the entire process over, uh, over the entire roast. Um, that again is where the rate of rise is gonna be important to you. If you, if you feel as though you wanna have some, some variability in the front side with a really slow controlled roast development, 
um, knowing where your target points are and calculating your rate of rise and then looking at that in your in your either your software application or your EM calculations will, will get you there. So it'll help you hit your targets. Um, so again, um, I, for me, I, I think say thinking out of outside the box is really important. Going long, going short, um, interpolating is is really the only way to go. When you have the outside data points and the inside data point, you can find a place in between and try to try to hit that target mark. You can spend a lot of time trying to go from an endpoint and working your way outward. Um, there's nothing really to correlate uh, where you're going with that. So I think it's really important to to you know set up some experiments like like we're going to have here with the coffees that you're roasting, and you'll tune into them uh, much more quickly. And so um, <coughs> I think. Uh, I'll run down through these slides, and then uh, Jens is going to have the cupping ready for us um, pretty soon. And so, so basically, I want to I want to show you some of the slides that I've created from the roasting profiles. So, I've got a Costa Rican coffee. Um, this was one approach here. I, if, if those of you who are familiar with Propster, I don't know how how many people out here are using data logging software like Propster. A few of you. Um, what it does is there's more information than this that's available, but basically this is a bean curve, which is showing the bean development temperature, and then down below it is, is what we call our rate of rise. And um, this, I apologize, is in Fahrenheit uh, scale, so for those of you who <laughs> aren't aware of that. Um, but more significant to that is, um, you know, we see the, um, the bean curve. I, I had a flame out on this roaster. I was working on a, a Giesen W1, and it had a very uh, sensitive burner. And so I was trying to control the heat down, and it, it actually dropped out on me there. So it, it's a pretty responsive roaster, as you can see by that curve. A lot of roasters would, wouldn't even flinch. But um, this curve down here is, is the, the rate of rise curve. And this is going to vary depending upon what your intention in approaching the roast is. Um, and, and you'll see it on this one, it actually is, is a little bit rounder curve. Um, the next profile is the same copy. And what I attempted to do on this one was to just go with a flat line approach. And again, I um, hit, uh, I'll take the other one back here just to give you some data points. Excuse me. Okay, so on the, uh, the first copy, I hit first crack at about nine minutes, and I had about a two and a half minute uh, roast development time. I was really trying to get my rate of rise um, down to what I consider to be um, a fairly uh, fairly slow rise uh, for conversion. Uh, five degrees Fahrenheit per minute, or uh, per 30 seconds, um, which is about the bottom end for me. I think what happens when you do this type of profile and you reach the end of the roast development period, you run the risk of stalling the roast and, and baking out the coffee. So this is a little bit more challenging than uh, the, the approach of going with a more consistent, rapid um, development. I mean, this is like a flat line curve, but I think the results are, are pretty interesting. So we did these uh, both at around 11 minute completion times. This first crack started a little late at nine minutes, 57 seconds. Um, and uh, total development time on this was about two minutes. And so I'm gonna just run through really quickly here. Then this was stretching the roast out um, an additional two minutes. Same profile as the first profile, but with a longer total uh, roast time. Um, again, same profile here as the second profile, um, but with a flat line uh, curve. So the, the distinction here, I think, uh, is really where are we taking um, where are we taking the sugars and the coffee early in the roast, and where do we want where do we want to be with them towards the end of the roast, and, and have that balance in uh, in the cup? And so, I, I'm hoping that these will present themselves very differently on the table out there. I think they will. And uh, so, and again, we're going to run through the, the Kenyan coffees that I roasted were they behaved a little bit more um, cooperatively. But again, similar sort of curve. Um, we uh, completed this roast in, in just about 11 minutes, first crack at eight minutes, 40 seconds, with um, almost a three minute roast development time. This was the flat line curve, um, uh, about 
12 minutes total, rose time, first crack at 10 minutes, 20 seconds, um, with a very short, uh, about a minute and a half uh, total development time after first crack. Um, and then the pr protracted rest, again, a quick acceleration on the front side and then a slow development um, with, this one actually um, has a longer rest development time, about uh, three, three and a half minutes, and then again, flat line with about two minute rest development time here. So, so I, I, I'm hoping that in, in tasting these coffees, we're gonna really see a difference in um, the, the body development, the um, uh, residual um, acidity and the balance between the two. And um, so at this point, I'm ready to go cup some coffee with you. So, great. We'll come back afterwards, um, and then we can have so we can have some discussion about uh, what we what we find in the coffee.